Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, tonight I wanted to talk to you just about something. I'm really going to take a physical principle. I want to talk to you about something that a friend of mine and I, we were discussing, we were out together and we were talking about it. And it was just, it was one of those things when you're talking and you start thinking about it, you say, man, you look to each other and you say, hey, that'll preach. And I want to talk to you about a physical principle that so applies to the spiritual. It's really a spiritual message, but as we look at this in the physical, I want to not just take it to the spiritual. I really believe that this will bless you. How many of you guys want to be in this place successful in life? How many of you guys want to be fulfilled in life? How many of you want to be blessed in your walk with God? I believe that this message really speaks to all of us in this place. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be fit Physically, I believe that we can take the physical example that we're looking at spiritually, but we can also turn it back around and use it physically as well. And today I want to talk to you about the subject of getting strong and staying strong. Getting strong and staying strong. Now, we look at that and we think about that. And I was at the gym and, uh, with a friend of mine. I don't go to a normal gym. I'll, I'll kind of tell a little bit about that uh, later on tonight. I don't go to a normal gym. I, I've, for the longest time, I've been an active person. I was thinking back to what my wife and I have done since the longest time. I mean, we do the backpacking thing. We've been whitewater rafting. Uh, you know, we do the rock climbing thing, mountain bikes. I, I've, I've loved to be outside. Everything about what I do, I like to be f- active. And there was a time in my life where I had uh, an injury to my hip. Just from walking, and, and from walking, it caused a, a lot of pain in my hips, and, and, it, and it forced me to kind of be sidelined of just physical activity. I couldn't really walk, I couldn't, I couldn't hike anymore, I couldn't do backpacking, I had to go through physical therapy. And because of the pain in my hip, I, I really just took a sedentary life, you know, where no activity anymore, no, no action, just kind of sitting at a desk, coming home, sitting on a couch, and, and doing that over and over and over again. And I, and I really lost everything. I mean, I lost all my physical activity. I lost all my things, all all of my ability to do anything that required exertion. And uh, my friend and I were at the gym. Um, Reverend Antonio, he's an awesome guy. We were at the gym, and we were talking about that. I had taken him to a place where uh, instead of lifting weights, you climb walls, rock climbing. And it's a really good workout with your arms, with your legs, with your core. It's all, all over the place. And we were talking about that on the way out. Because he was talking about how his arms were just like jelly. And, 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 and you know, even though he's a, uh, an active guy himself, you know, he's like, man, my arms, I, I, I don't have it anymore. I used to have it. You know, I used to, he talked about being in soccer. And he talked about, and we were talking about, and it's amazing that in, in, the, in the physical world, if you have something and you don't utilize it, if you don't use it over and repeat it, if you don't stay on top of it, you lose it. Your muscle begins to lose mass. You begin to lose strength. You, you, you begin to deteriorate and gain more fat than muscle and so forth and so on. But, you know, it goes so far beyond just fitness. Think about it like this. Uh, you know, maybe I, I was on the Daniel fast in the month of January. It was awesome. Actually, it was terrible. But either way, it was awesome because I really wanted to lose a couple pounds. And because I only ate veggies and rice and I cried every day because of that, I lost 10 pounds. I mean, it was great. I'd wake up in the morning and I would be at my target weight with all my clothes on. You know, uh, normally, if you, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about, you got a target weight, you try to go, you know, like you, you wear as little clothes as you can and you try to let all the air out of your lungs because that might weigh something, anything that would weigh you down. And I remember getting on the scale and I was at my target weight with everything, my phone in my pocket and, and my wallet, my pants and my shoes. And I'm like, this is awesome. Well, don't you know about two weeks after the Daniel fast, everything I lost came back. Because you know in a diet, if you're trying to make a change, if you don't stay on it, if you go back to just a slight slip, just a little bit here or a little bit there, you know that if you don't stay on it, you'll eventually begin to lose it. Same thing with uh, uh, mastering something. I, I know my friend Cameron Ruffin, who plays the guitar. I mean, Cameron is a master at the guitar. And Cameron goes to that guitar center. I think it's called Guitar Mageddon or something like that, where he goes across the, the competitions around California. And, and he just, these guys just jam and shred the guitar. You don't get to a position like Cameron on the guitar by just not doing anything. Every day you got to put in the work. You got to practice. You got to you got to do the routine. You got to learn and you got to keep continuing. If you don't, your muscle memory will begin to fade. You'll forget the structures. You'll forget the the placements of your fingers. You see this applies to so many areas in life. Reading. 
You ever been a reader and then all of a sudden you took a break from reading maybe because you didn't want to read the book. You watched the movie and then you thought the movie was entertaining and you watched the other movie and then a couple of years later you think, man, I haven't read a book in a long time. And then you try to read a book and you think, man, I forgot how to read. Like, really? <laughs> if we don't use it, we begin to lose it. We know this. We understand this principle physically. We understand this principle within our lives. We've all been there with diets. We've all been there with, you know, uh, workout routines, New Year's resolutions. We've all been there saying, I'm going to further my education or I'm going to master this subject or this topic or whatever it might be. We've all been there. And we realize that if we let it go, if we let it slip, if we miss a day or two days, then two days becomes three or four, and then it goes from twice a week to once a week and once a week to once a month and once a month to once a year, and then we forget. And we slip back into where we were before we ever started. The same principle applies to us spiritually. That if we don't stay on top of our spirit, if we don't stay on top of our soul, on top of our walks with God, then what happens is life begins to creep back in. It's not that God leaves us. Hey, come on, let's get that right. Okay, let's get it straight. It's not that God ever leaves us. But it's rather that we begin to become distracted. Much like sleeping in one day instead of going to the gym and you realize how much you really miss that sleep. So you sleep in and then the next time you're supposed to go to the gym, you think, man, it was really nice. I felt really good the day I slept in. And you sleep in again. And, and even, even when we do that spiritually, we say, oh, you know what, I'm going to. I'm going to back off a little bit. I, I used to read my Bible, but, uh, you know, the, my favorite TV show is on, and my devotional time was right at the same time as my TV show. And so, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to move this around here. I'm going to move this around here. And we begin to back off or slack off or, or even it, uh, uh, unintentionally be, become distracted by life and what life has to bring. What happens is we begin this downward progression in our spiritual walks of allowing the old nature, allowing the old person, allowing the flesh of, 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 our, of, our, of, our, of our being to come back into our body. We lose that just like you would lose physical strength if you stopped working out. Just like you would lose the mental knowledge if you stopped uh, uh, doing the Sudoku puzzle or whatever it is that you got into or the crosswords. Just like you would lose the muscle memory if you stopped practicing your instrument. The same exact principle applies to us spiritually. We've got to stay on top of our walks with God. We've got to discipline our bodies. We've got to have a commitment to look at it because we don't want to go back. You're here for a reason. You're at church listening to the teachings of Jesus Christ because you believe that Jesus will change your life. And today we're going to look at what happens when we begin to slack off and we begin to let go of that or we don't put our full effort into it, what happens in our lives. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter, we're going to play around a little bit. We're going to look at some analogies. Paul's got some really uh, artful descriptions of our Christian walk. So 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. We're going to look at some scriptures beginning in verse number 24. 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 24. Paul says, do you not know? I love that. It's kind of like a, one of those, those statements to you and I, like, don't you realize? Hello? Everybody knows this. It's common knowledge. He says, didn't you know? Don't you know? Those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, Paul says, I run thus. I like that. I run this way, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul paints a picture here in this section of scripture. He's giving us an analogy. He's giving us a metaphor, something that we can take outside of the realm of our Christian walk. We can all relate to the picture of an athlete. Now more than ever, in Paul's day, what Paul's talking about, we'll talk about this in a moment, is Paul's talking about the elite athletes of his time. The great games uh, of, the, of the European region. We know this, the Olympics and things of that nature. These were very common, very special, have very high regard. 
People understood this, but you and I, we look at this, we look at things like, I mean, it's March Madness. We're going crazy over the uh, uh, NCAA and the bracketology and, and all the different upsets and all the different teams. We've got things like the Super Bowl, the, the, the things like the World Series, things like the World Cup. And so we understand the, the realm, we understand the analogy of the athlete. When you look at some of these guys that play these professional sports, or some of these women that play these professional sports, they're not just anybody. They're elite athletes that have worked their entire life to get to where they're at. They're the top 1% of people who play that game in the world. It's the perfect example of a life of discipline and a life of dedication. They literally have dedicated their lives to becoming what they are. And so Paul uses that analogy for you and I. By looking at the athlete, by looking at the, the analogy or the, the story, the example of somebody that has mastered something in their lives, he says to you and I that we can learn from that. Today I want to talk to you about some of these principles, some of these truths out of what Paul's talking, looking at this analogy. And yes, listen, don't mistake what we're talking about. I'm talking about your spiritual walk with God. But I'll tell you this, I believe with all my heart, this carries over to your health. This carries over to your desire to, to, to get uh, fit, if maybe you're, that's one of your things, or your desire to live a healthier life, or, or whatever it might be, you, your desire to, to be successful in business, whatever it might be, I believe this principle applies to your lives. But more so, and the most important thing that we can focus on, I don't want you to get distracted by, what, by me saying that, by losing the spiritual aspect of that. Because the most important thing is not that we make a lot of money in life. The most important thing is that not that we're able to, to, to get to a target weight or to eat healthy or, or to, to leave behind something that we, we've been desiring to leave behind or to grow somewhere that we've been wanting to grow. More important than that is the state of our spiritual condition. That's the most important thing in our lives. But I do believe that this will apply to you in all of the areas of your life, your physical life your desire, maybe you want to get back into something, or education, or you want to pick up a new subject, or whatever it might be. Listen, it's not just for the young, but for all. And Paul gives us this illustration of an athlete, and I think that there's some things that we should learn here. Looking again now at verse number 24, Paul says these words. He says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? Paul's talking about the elite athlete. He's talking about those who have made it a point to become professional athletes. Yes, they had professional athletes in Paul's time. They had games like the Olympics. They had games that were regional games, that, that people traveled from all over the world, from all over Europe, from all over the different areas uh, uh, regionally to attend and to see and to watch these games and, and hear this word that those who run in a race, the words run in a race, can actually be translated in the original Greek language another way. You know what that way is? Those who run in a stadium. Paul is talking about elite athletics. He's not talking about two boys on the street trying to race each other. Paul's talking about elite athletes, people who are careers, professional athletes. And he says, those who run in a race, those who run in a stadium, all run. They're there for a reason. They're not just there to spectate. They didn't just show up. They didn't just dedicate their lives so that they can try to participate. They are there to run the race. And why do they run the race? So that they would receive a prize. In his day, it was a, a, a crown. Uh, of leaves. You've seen the pictures of the Olympians. As a matter of fact, they still give it to the Olympic gold medalists, the, the little leaf crown that you see. There was a crown that perished. It dried up. It faded away. He says, but we, we receive a prize that is imperishable. But he tells us, run in such a way that you may obtain it. Take the example of the professional athlete, Paul says. They have an understanding. All who run in the race run, but only one receives the prize. We can't get so wrapped up in the imagery that Paul is talking about that we try to figure out theologically what he's talking about, one prize. Well, what is that one prize? Is that one prize that mean only one person finds God? Or, or is the one prize only the one church? Paul's painting an image of elite athleticism, and we want to focus on what Paul is talking about. He's saying this. Athletes 
understand without a doubt that not everybody who participates in the race wins. And because they realize that not everybody gets a trophy. You remember there was a time when, when kids, maybe you were one of those, when you played in sports. I remember when I was in high school and I was in junior high and I was a kid, I played roller hockey. I know, roller hockey in California. It's like, what? I know. Not everybody got a trophy. Nowadays, you got kids in sports, you know it. Man, everybody goes through. I have my, my little nephew. He was so proud. He came out and he brought a box. He's only five years old. He, he's only five years old and he brought a file box of trophies. This is my trophy for baseball. This is my trophy for softball or for t-ball. This is my trophy for fall soccer. This is my trophy for spring soccer. I'm like, man, did you win all these? And it's like, no, everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> but you see, elite, elite ath athletes, they know that only one person or only one team can win the prize. Hey, the Patriots, the Seahawks, I know, it's bitter. They knew that only one team would come away the victor. That when, when the, the game is over and the confetti and the ticker tape uh, flies throughout the stadium, nobody cares about the losing team. Do you ever notice that? That the, uh, that the press, that the, the cameramen, that the photographers, they all run to the winning team, to the winning coach, to the MVP player. Why? Because they understand that only one person can win. So we've got to learn from this, that they run in such a way, that they discipline, that they, they have a life so disciplined that they realize that they do everything they do to win. And we as Christians have got to learn from the message, to learn from the example of the athlete that what we do spiritually, we do it for victory. That if we slack off, that if we let go, or if we see failure and we give up, that we're not taking the example here. Think about it for a moment. Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympian in history, did he give up the first time in his life he lost a swimming match? What about Babe Ruth? Did Babe Ruth give up the first time he didn't hit a home run or he struck out? Joe Montana. Did Joe Montana give up the first time he experienced a loss in football? Take it beyond sports. How about this? How about Shakespeare? Did William Shakespeare give up the first time he wrote a flop? Think about that for a moment. Not everything he wrote was good. How about Bach or, or, or Beethoven or Mozart? Did they give up the very first time they hit a sour note writing one of their symphonies? No. Because we understand and we see that in the athletic world, and in the field of mastery, in the field of music, in the field of education, we realize that not everybody always wins all the time. That success is not guaranteed for every match. We see that, we understand that, we say, man, that's great. But for some reason in Christianity, Christians, upon their first failure, walk away. It's a principle that applies to sports, to everything else in life. But why is it that Christians, when they experience failure or when they don't first succeed, walk away? We understand this. I remember I was at a conference one time and somebody was asking Pastor Brian Houston, who's the founder of Hillsong Church. They said, man, you know, we're young. It was for young pastors. And they said, man, we're young. We want to learn from you. I mean, it seems like everything you do is successful. What is your model? What do you do to be so successful? And he kind of chuckled, and Brian Houston has this really like, <laughs> like real deep laugh. It's just fun to listen to. And he, said, he asked this question back in return. He says, have you ever heard of, of, of what was that? Do you remember the Hillsong? Paris. Have you ever heard of Hillsong Paris? Have you ever heard of, there was another one. It was uh, in, in Europe. Milan. Milan. Have you ever heard of Hillsong Paris? Milan, and he named off a couple other cities around the world. Have you ever heard of Hillsong so-and-so? And the young guy says, no. He said, exactly. You see, not everything he's done was a complete success. We realize within sports, 
we realize within mastering a subject that setbacks are what create the motivation to press forward. That when Michael Phelps lost, he said, that's a reason for me to get back into the pool and not take it so lazy, but to start working harder than I've ever worked before. When, when Joe Montana lost the game, that's a reason for me to get back there and start practicing my throws. When, when Beethoven hit a sour note or when Shakespeare wrote a bad, that's a reason for me to get in there and really start to think about what can I do to make this better. But then when it comes to our Christian walk, we see failure or we see a setback in our belief and we say, well, God must not be real, must not have worked, he let me down and we move on. We can't let ourselves get that way. Because what happens is the question is why do so many believers quit when they don't proceed? And the reason is is that because they are not conditioned for the truths of life. We have conditioned ourselves to everything that's good about Christianity. We've conditioned our minds that Christianity is all about the good, all about the highs, all about the rainbows and the pots of gold and the blessings and, and all the different things that come with serving Christ. We've conditioned ourselves and we say that when I get into Jesus Christ, that everything is good for the rest of my life and then something that's not good happens and we say, well, Jesus must have failed me. But when you look in the Bible, you can't find that anywhere. That's not doctrine. That's not truth. Jesus told his own disciples, hey, the world will hate you because it hated me. The Bible tells us in the book of James in the first chapter, hey, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You see, it's the same principle for us, that in our Christian walks, we will have setbacks. We have a choice to look at that setback and say, well, God must have failed me, or to look at that setback and say, all right, what can I learn from that? Because, you know, they say the best vision is hindsight. It's 2020. When you look back on something, crystal clear. I remember the lowest point in my Christian walk was when Stacey and I first got married. I preached about it a couple of times. We, just, we had a dog. I didn't even think the lowest point of your Christian walk was a dog. Well, I'd just gotten out of Bible college. I was all full of faith. and I'm, We're praying and we're speaking in tongues over our dog who had kidney disease. And we're, we're on our face. We're fasting. We're praying, doing everything we could. And nothing happened. Dog died. Man, it was terrible. I thought for, for the longest time, man, God must have failed me. This faith message is, is just, just a bunch of uh, hoo-ha. Serious questions. But looking back in hindsight, man, 10 years later, that was such a lesson. That my faith today is stronger because of that trial then. Because of that setback in my faith. Because I made a choice after getting over myself and saying, you know what? I'm going to condition myself. Like an athlete, I'm going to still press on. I'm not going to count, even though I'll take the loss, I'll keep pushing forward in my walk with God. And as I die, I look back now and I say, man, I learned more from that disastrous moment than I did in three years of blessings. Setbacks are the vessels in which we grow. So we can't look at setbacks and defeats in our, in our spiritual life as a means to give up. Hey, Guess what? We talked about this with Peter, John, and Paul, and all throughout the Bible. The Bible is full of imperfect people, people with drama, people with problems. Why? Because we, if anything can learn, that setbacks do not stop us. We pick ourselves up. We get the determination. We keep focusing, and we say, I'm going to learn from this. What can I take as a lesson from that and move on with God? Maybe you're in a diet. Maybe you're trying to lose weight. And you gorged one day. I, I, I'm going to call him out, my friend over there. He ate a whole pizza in one day on a diet. It's all good, man. Setbacks don't have to stop you. Pick yourself up. Don't give up because you had a defeat or a setback. Keep pressing on. Paul says, learn the example from the elite athlete. They understand that everything that they're in, they're not going to win. Sure, they want to win everything, but they know that they'll lose in times of their lives. But that only makes winning better. Think about it like this. If it wasn't challenging, there would be no masters. Why? Because everybody would be a master. If it wasn't hard, 
everybody would do it. And then it wouldn't be special. You know, I was talking about going to a climbing gym. You know, I, I celebrated. I remember the first time I, I did a real tough route with my little brother-in-law. He's 14 years old. Him and I did this really tough route at the gym. We got down, we hugged each other. We were like on cloud now. We're driving in the car. And we're like, oh my goodness, we did it. Because it took us weeks to try to get over that. Did you know I've never celebrated after climbing a ladder? <laughs> Think about that for a moment. Got up on top of the ladder, put my Christmas lights up. Didn't celebrate getting it. Man, I made it to the top of the ladder. Why? Because it's not hard. There's not a challenge. It didn't take dedication and determination. Same thing. Church, with your walk with God. When you trip and fall, when you're believing for something and maybe you don't see that, maybe God says, my will was a little bit different than yours. Hey, don't take that as defeat and give up. Keep pressing forward because ultimately we run to obtain the prize. You guys with me tonight? So looking then again, now going on. Verse number 25, he says, everyone who competes, competes for the prize or everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we, an imperishable, they are disciplined in what they do. Everything they do in their lives is to help better what they're disciplining themselves for. Think about it like this. I remember there was this episode of The Office. Anybody remember that show, The Office on TV? It was kind of that comedy on NBC. There was a time when they ran a, a marathon or a 5K to prepare himself, the, the, the manager of the office, right before the run, ate a big bowl of fettuccine Alfredo. Well, anybody who knows when you have physical exertion, you don't want to eat fettuccine Alfredo. And about halfway into the marathon, he's talking about how he's an expert runner, now how he's done this, and he's prepared, and he's got everything ready to go. And you know what happens? He throws up everywhere on the TV show. You see, athletes... Masters at what they do. Everything they do, they dedicate and are disciplined. The star athlete does not wake up and eat a dozen donuts for breakfast. You know what I'm talking about? And expect to win the game. Which means what we can learn from, from a disciplined athlete, from a person who's mastered something in their life, is that we can't feed ourselves junk food and expect championship results. Spiritually speaking, you cannot feed yourself junk and expect champion results. You cannot feed your soul television seven hours a day and church 30 minutes a week and expect championship results. Because that's like a star athlete. I see my friend Curtis. Curtis, you don't, I know you don't eat donuts all the time. I mean, you might now, it's off season, but when you're in the game, right, you're prepared. Eating the things that you're supposed to be, he's a college student, that's probably a bad example, huh? He's like, no, I got you. You eat what you need to eat to get you the protein and the energy to get through it, to get through the match, to get through the discipline, to get through the battle, to get through the trial. When we as a church feed ourselves the things of God, when we feed ourselves the word of God, when we feed ourselves the good and the healthy food from the spirit, from the word of God, we are preparing our soul. We are preparing our spirit for a victory, for championship results. But if we starve ourselves spiritually and we gorge ourselves on the flesh or on the television or on the internet or whatever it might be, we cannot realistically in our lives, come on, expect championship results which means you got to go after it you got to run for it you got to push for it you got to be determined for it you know as, as a pastor people come up to me probably my number one prayer request people pastor I need you to pray for me I need direction in my life you can't go to the pastor and ask for direction in your life and not do your part to get it and expect to get it Some of you are like, man, that's an oh me. That's not amen. I'm not amen in there. <laughs> Listen, if you're not going to go for it, you're not going to get championship results. Yeah. If you're not going to be dedicated, determined, disciplined to do what needs to be done, the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, get wisdom at all costs. 
The Bible tells us in James, if anybody lacks wisdom to ask God who would give to all liberally and without reproach to those who ask in faith, which means you got to ask, not just me. you got to go after it. You've got to be determined. Listen, physically speaking, if it's your health, if it's your, if it's your fitness, if it's your New Year's resolution, resolution you've got to go after it because you won't get it sitting on the couch. You know you've been there. You've tried. Determination, dedication, discipline is what brings the results. We have got to learn to discipline our spirit. Say, I'll stop feeding it junk. I'll start feeding it good stuff because it's the good stuff that makes me grow. Are you guys with me today? Paul says in Philippians chapter three, verse number 14, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call Paul says, man, I forget everything that's behind me and I press. I mean, Paul is painting the picture in Philippians in the third chapter. He's saying, man, I am running with my arms out. Have you ever seen uh, sprinters when they come to the finish line and there's that ribbon? Whoever breaks that ribbon first, I mean, you see they got their chests out. Some of them fall. They're leaning so far forward when they land because they are trying to press as hard as they can for that prize. Paul's saying, man, if you want it, if you want change, if you want growth in your life, if you want to be successful, if you want to be strong spiritually speaking, so that when you go through challenges, when you go through bouts, when you go through the different things in your life, you've got to press after it, to seek after God, to be disciplined, to go after it, even when you don't feel like it, even when you don't want to, to get up, spend time with God, Get into the word of God. You say, man, I don't feel like praying right now. That's the best time to begin to discipline, to start pressing after the word of God. Man, I'm going to get into the word. I don't feel like going to church today. I've already been there on Sunday. But press in. I don't feel like, I feel like just zoning out. Turn the TV off and sit in silence to listen to the voice of God. If we don't seek it, man, I'll tell you what. The Bible tells us that God says that we will find him when we search for him with all of our hearts. You gotta want it, you gotta desire it, you gotta press for it. Paul the Apostle says, I press. I'm gonna give you a formula for success. You want a formula for success? Yeah. Formula for ses- success, before I give it to you, I'll give you the formula for no success. Intentions does not equal results. So if you want failure in your life, there it is. It's all you, have at it. The little equal with the slash that says does not equal. Intentions do not equal results. You know, you, know, you know that's true. Why? Because you've had too many failed diets. Too many failed New Year's resolutions. Have you ever heard the t- phrase before? Let's, let's get deep with it. Have you ever heard the phrase before? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Intentions will not do anything in your life. The formula for success is this. Intention plus a mechanism equals results. What does that mean? Talking about machinery? No, let me give it to you. Okay, here's a a real world physical example. I want to get strong. All right, Pastor Luke is lanky. I'm skinny and I got back fat now, okay? (laughs) I want to get rid of that. I can intend all I want to get rid of that. But did you know that intentions will never get me anywhere? Intention doesn't build muscle. You know what builds muscle? Resistance. That's the mechanism. Intention is the drive to resistance which builds muscle. Which means if I really have an intention to get rid of it, I'll get off my duff and go do something about it. How about this? You want to be wealthy. You want to be successful. You want to have a good business. You want to be a good father. You want to be a good mother. You want to be a good Christian. Intentions, hey man, that's great. But if you have intentions and say, man, I intend to be a good dad, but you don't do anything about being a good dad, guess what? You're not going to get the results of a good dad. You want to be a successful business person? Man, I I want to make millions of dollars. And you sit on the couch and hope that, that a pyramid scheme comes your way or you win the lottery. Guess what? Statistics are highly against you. 
But the people that say, man, I'm going to do something with my life. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to beat the streets. I'll start at the bottom end of the rung, and I'll work my way up the ladder. See, here's the deal. True intention provides the mechanism. If you really want it, you'll figure it out. I'll give you a real-world example. That girl right there in the front row in the, white, in the white sweater. What's up, girl? I had intentions for her to be my wife. You know what? I followed her to college. I didn't even want to go to that university. I went for her. I had them, I followed, my intentions brought about the mechanism. I did whatever I could to get that girl. And now I got her. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> True intentions will provide a mechanism. I've had somebody ask me, young people often ask, Pastor, look, how do I motivate myself to get into the word of God? Pastor, look, how do I get motivated? Here's how. So easy. If you really want it, you'll get it. If you really believe that Jesus will change your life, You'll do it. So you've got to start thinking, do I really want to watch TV right now or do I want my life changed? Start examining and looking at your intentions. Because I'll tell you what, God will move and speak to you when you do. David, a man after God's own heart, did not get that title because he was born that way. David on the hills of Judea when he was watching sheep was singing songs about God. Filling his heart up, filling his mind up about God's faithfulness. Why? He was preparing himself, disciplining himself for his battle. Guess what? That battle came by the name of Goliath. And David was prepared because he was disciplined in feeding himself his desires. He knew that God would bail him out. And God bailed him out. Church, if you want it, you go after it. Go after it. Are you with me tonight? I know I'm going so long. We're going to wrap it up right now. 1 Corinthians 9, 26, 27. Paul says this, I run thus. Not with uncertainty. Thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself had sh uh, should become disqualified. Church, you gotta pick yourself up. Motivate yourself. What is your intention? Do you wanna be strong? Do you wanna be successful? Do you wanna be fit for the kingdom of God? When God calls you, do you wanna be ready like the Bible says to be ready in season and out? Then you gotta pick yourself up. Like Paul says, man, my intention my motivation is victory, and because I had intentions, I came up with the mechanism, self-discipline, through the word of God. Jesus Christ is your mechanism. This is not a self-betterment message. You get a hold of Jesus Christ, and you get into Jesus as much as you can get, and then you get some more of Jesus, and then you get more of Jesus, and then you get even more of Jesus in your life, and guess what? Things will begin to happen, because it starts small, but it always gets bigger. In February... I pulled out something I had for eight years, a pull-up bar. Oh, my Lord. I had intentions of putting something on these lanky arms. So I sat there. My wife was laughing at me because some of us started doing pull-ups. Did you know how many I could do? You know how many I could do? Zero pull-ups. Not, I, I sat there. I couldn't even pull up. I had to get a chair. And I had to stand on the chair and use my legs. But you know what? I did that. After a while, I got a, I got a footstool instead of a chair. After a while, after the footstool, guess what? I, I could do one. One pull-up. It was awesome. I was like, babe, I did it. Guess what? The next week, I could do two. The next week, I could do three. The next week, I could do four. The week after that, I could do five. Then I could do a pull-up and I can come up and I can hold myself. And then I can come halfway down and I can hold myself. And then I can go all the way down and I can hold myself. And I can do pull-ups like that. It starts small. But Paul says, man, I got motivation. I will run thus. Church, there is no reason for you to decide not to be successful in your walk with God. It takes the intention, the motivation, the, the mechanism is Jesus Christ. It's not about knowledge. It's not about getting in there and studying theology. It's about spending genuine time with the Lord and Savior of your life and getting him into you, and you will be strong. Longevity is the message. Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside the weight and sin that so easily ensnares us and run the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Church, the message is about longevity. Makes no difference if you get strong and wash out. Let it go. Don't wash out because you, you tripped. 
Don't wash out because you slept in. Don't wash out because you, you went back to something. Hey, pick yourself up. Get into Jesus Christ. Start working again. Even if you've got to start with one pull-up, spiritually speaking, start there. That'll be a victory. Then the next victory will be a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one. And in hindsight, you'll look back and you'll say, man, I run thus. My intention is to be successful in my spiritual walk and my motivation and my mechanism is Jesus Christ. And he has done everything through the grace of God to empower me to be who God has called me to be. You guys get something out of the word of God tonight? I preached forever. <laughs> We're done. Church is out in two minutes. Oh, Lord, help us. God is good, amen? Well, hey, listen, let's do this. Before we, we'll do offering in just a moment. Before we do, I just want to take the time because I know some of you are, you, go, you got to leave and you got to go. And you know what, to be honest with you, as a pastor, man, we, we need your involvement financially, but what's more important is your soul. So here's the deal. If you're in this place today and maybe you've been messing around, maybe you've been doing your, the church thing, Maybe you've been doing the religion thing. Listen, let me tell you today, you can't get to heaven based on your own devices. You can't get to heaven because you're a good person. Can't get to heaven because you go to church. Can't get to heaven because you read your Bible. Can't get to heaven because you know who Jesus is. I love you enough, I respect you enough to tell you the truth. You can't get to heaven your way. The only way you can get there is God's way. Today, I want to give that invitation to you. If that's you in this place, the Bible says, here's the deal. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Maybe you're in this place during the praise and worship and God spoke to you. Maybe it was during the message and God spoke to you and said, hey, I want you. I want you to know. I want you. The goodness of God speaking to you. I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment to give your heart, to give your life to God. You see, Jesus tells a religious man, Nicodemus, the only way you and I can spend eternity with God in heaven, a relationship with him is through being born again. It's not what Hollywood and internet and society's made it out to be. It means it's that you've given all of your heart, you've given all of your life to God. It's not about your thought process, not about your mental ascent or carnal knowledge of who God is. It's about a wholehearted relationship growing every day with Jesus Christ. And today, I want to give you that opportunity. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, if you're messing around, he says, if you're lukewarm, Jesus says, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What he's saying is that lukewarm Christians are going to be rejected, expelled from the kingdom of God, and I don't want that to be you. So wherever you're at in this place, I want to give you the opportunity. Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess him before men, he'll confess you. If you deny him, he'll deny you. Today, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and the count of three, I'll go bang. And when I do, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing tonight is you're saying, hey, I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. Today, I want to make that commitment. Today, you know, I've been doing my thing. I've been, I've been living under pretenses. I feel like the Spirit of God is pulling on me, and it's time for me to make a decision if that's you in this place, I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll go forward together from there, wherever you're at in this place. Who should raise their hands? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus, if that's you in just a moment. Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did it in the youth group or a harvest crusade. You prayed that prayer once long ago, but you never really followed through with it. Come on. If that's you in this place today, get ready. Maybe you've been doing lukewarm. What's lukewarm mean? It means you've got your ups and your downs, your ins and your outs, occasional church attendance. Listen. If you've been playing games with God, if you've been doing it your way, listen, come on, today, let's make this the day you go forward for God in this place. The Spirit of God speaking to you wherever you're at, from the front row to the back row. Jesus Christ is the only way that we can spend eternity with God in heaven. He's not in the business of condemning you. He's in the business of redeeming you. And that's what Jesus came to do, to redeem you. And now in return, he wants your heart, he wants your life. And it starts tonight by making that decision. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, from the front to the back, in just a moment, if that's you, I'm going to count to three. Pop your hand up. We've been raising our hands all night. If that's you, get ready. Be proud about it. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down, and we'll go forward together from there. Whether you're here for an hour, you've been at this church your first time, or you've been here for 26 years, it doesn't matter. What matters today is the condition of your soul, and it's time for you to stop playing games, stop messing around, and get dedicated and disciplined by following after Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Today, if that's you in this place, get ready wherever you're at, from the front row to the back. From side to side, family rooms, if that's you guys back there, you too. At home, if you're still with us on the live stream, if that's you in just a moment, get ready. On the count of three, you ready? If that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. One, two, three. I see you right there. Anybody else in this place today? Where are you at? I see that hand right there. I see that hand right there. I see that hand right there. All right. Anybody else in this place? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should, come on. 
Quit playing games with God. Quit messing around. Maybe you've stumbled. Maybe you've fallen. It's time to pick yourself up. Get back into that game. Get back into that race. Anybody else? Four people or so. Anybody else in this place today? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. Anybody else? All right, I see you, my man. Right on, brother. Anybody else in this place today? Well, praise God for four or five wise people, amen? Awesome, great job. Here's what we're gonna do. For those of you that raise your hands, I saw you guys. Listen, you don't get saved by raising your hands. Say, I want to. You're making that decision. Now it's time to follow through, to get dedicated to it, and we're gonna do that together. Just a moment, we're all gonna stand. If you raised your hand, or maybe you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, listen, it's okay. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. If you need a friend, I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle and come meet me right here. Let's change destinies together right here, right now. So let's all stand together. Please, nobody leave. I promise I'll let you out in just a few minutes. But if you raised your hands or you should have raised your hands, wherever you're at, come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come meet me up here today. Let's change destinies together right here, right now. Jesus, I you. you can come, come on, Jesus, if that's you. Congratulations, I'm right. Come on. The reason that I believe. Jesus, I believe. Wherever you're at, if that's you, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. Oh man, my heart breaks. Listen, I, I, you don't get saved because you raised your hand in a church service. You get saved because you give your heart, you give your life to Jesus Christ, and that's what we're doing here. You say, I want to do that right now. So you think walking out of here makes you okay with God because you popped your hand up. I want to tell you the truth. That's not the case. And if you raised your hand, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I know we're going late, but I'll tell you what. I know that this church loves you enough to give you the time to make that decision to follow through. And it'd be a shame for you to walk out of here after having gone through the motions and think that everything's okay when it's not. So if that's you in this place and you know who you are because the Bible tells us, the word of God, that it's the goodness of God. It's God speaking to you right now. If that's you, don't start the first few moments of your relationship with God in rebellion by not doing what he's asked. Start by making that commitment. So we're gonna, Elijah's gonna sing that song. If that's you, you should have raised your hand or you didn't or you did raise your hand but you're not here. Come on, if that's you, get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come meet me right here today. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I sing. Jesus, I believe. All right. Hey, you've been told. My man, what's your name, brother? Richard. Richard. My friend, listen, this is my buddy, Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there and lead you in a prayer, all right, my man? Just go hang out with him for just a moment. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. 
Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.